So welcome to FACT's webinar called Tips for Offering Virtual Experiences on Your Farm. Our presenters today are Scotty Jones from Leaping Lamb Farm in Oregon and Lee Rankin from Apple Hill Farm in North Carolina. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust and I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director. I'm going to be moderating this session. So thanks everyone for coming. Let me just take a minute or two to give a few quick introductions before we dive in. Um, Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, we are a national nonprofit organization. We are based in Illinois um, and we, we promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. And I have the honor and pleasure of um, working with our Humane Farming Program which works with farmers across the country, and we offer services such as grants, scholarships, uh, mentorship, and of course, webinars on all sorts of topics. So I would invite you to please visit our website to learn uh, more about our farmer services, um, including our Fund to Farmer grants, for which we are currently accepting applications. So this is time. I'm very, very pleased to introduce our first presenter, the fantastic Scotty Jones. Scotty and her husband, Greg, own and operate Leaping Lamb Farm uh, in Oregon, where they raise sheep, chickens, and produce. And she's also the founder and executive director of the U.S. Farm Stay Association, which I did not know until I read it on your websites. So we're really lucky to have her with us today. So without further ado, I am going to pass this virtual microphone over to you, Scotty, so that you can get started. So take it away. Thank you. And I'm going to take off my video and I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to do this. in a sec. So it should be coming on here. I'm sharing my screen. Hang on a sec, you guys. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Just let me get this going. Okay. So once this actually goes. Okay. So we're going to talk about virtual farm experiences today. Thank you very much, Larissa, for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm excited to share what I know, and I will have to say some of it's by the seat of our pants. What I thought I would do to start, though, is just tell you all a little bit about who we are. So I own Leaping Lamb Farm, as Larissa said, with my husband here in Alsea, Oregon. We are about two hours south of Portland, and we're about 30 miles into the coast range from Corvallis, which is Oregon State University. We have been here since 2003. Our main product that we raise on the farm is lamb uh, for the meat market. Uh, we sell retail and we also sell whole lamb. Uh, but in 2007, having realized that selling 30 to 40 lambs a year wasn't going to pay for the tractor breakdown, we opened a farm stay. And so we have been hosting overnight guests uh, since that time. Uh, we do most of our marketing through our website. This is our home, the top of our homepage. And um, we do uh, some through our local tourism agency, but we do a lot of uh, guest referral in terms of uh, how, how we market. And this is what our homepage looks like. So you can see that uh, the main things we do are our farm stay that we promote um, and farm tours when we're talking about agritourism and not actual uh, land production. That's something that we have focused on. We've done really well. We had increased our farm tours, which are day tours. You can come and we will take you around at $10 per person uh, on a scheduled tour and kind of show you what we do and uh, then let people stay on our farm afterwards and experience it on their own. Uh, my personal feeling is that many urbanites are very disconnected from nature and very disconnected from anything hands-on, especially on a farm. So we allow a lot of interaction uh, with our livestock, with our creeks, with our woods. Um, and the special time on our farm in terms of our visitors is always spring when we're lambing. And uh, we not only allow our guests to come and be in the barn with us, a lot of them get to see lambs born, but we also have them help us if they're willing uh, to uh, take down notes for us, fill syringes, do all the kinds of things you do with uh, young lambs. 
This is our farmhouse where my husband and I lived until about four years ago, and we turned it into an additional uh, farm stay. Uh, I'll show you the cottage in a minute. But this allowed us to increase capacity because we were turning away 90% of the people that wanted to book with us. This is our cottage that we started with, and this faces out over our hay field. And you can see, uh, when I say that we're in the coast range, we actually have about 20 acres of pasture, but about uh, 45 acres of trees all around us. Um, and so our guests get uh, quite a farm forest experience uh, with us. Uh, when I said that we really like to do hands-on, that's me that likes to do hands-on. I really like to show kids and their uh, families uh, what we do. Uh, I figure these may, some of them be the future farmers of America. And um, yes, I hold hands and I'm the age to be Nana for a lot of them. Okay, so fast forward or backwards to uh, March of 2020. So COVID hit and I'm showing you my reservation calendar above. This is what it looked like April, 2019. That is our prime lambing season. It's also spring break. Uh, this is then below that, what our reservation looks like in April. And then that little handwritten scratchy thing because I'm of the age where I also like to have hard copy shows what happened in March where I basically had to cross out everybody and we, canceled reservations uh, basically through May. That uh, agritourism is, a, is the money maker on the farm more than selling lamb. And so we really needed to reassess our business model for other opportunities because I'm sure like all of you, you know, we make our money in the spring and the summer and we use that money to live fall and winter. So by the time we get to March, my bank account is really pretty empty. And so um, without trying to totally panic about the fact that we didn't have any money coming in, it was like, well, what else are we going to do? So one of the first things we did, which wasn't generally a moneymaker, but it was like, oh, my gosh, we've got to stay in front of our guests and remind them we're still here, is we really bumped up our social media. And uh, there are four of us with smartphones on the farm. Three of us take photographs. So with three of us taking photographs, we made sure we posted at least three photos a day. Of course, springtime is a wonderful time to be taking photographs on a farm. And of course, baby animals. If you think of anything that shows up on Facebook or Instagram that gets shared a lot, it'll be pictures of baby animals. So we had all of those. So this is the kind of thing that we did right here. We uh, mostly post on Instagram and we share it to Facebook automatically. But then we discovered something really interesting. On Instagram, we noticed we were getting a lot of likes on our videos. Now, we had a really cool thing going on this spring. Uncle Bruce is our ram. Uncle Bruce was in with our goat kids and the kids were using him as a jungle gem. So I guess I could have picked that picture to show you um, how interested people are in videos. However, um, I thought I'd show you the one of the asparagus because look at how many people it reached. Just the fact that uh, Denny was taking pictures of asparagus and putting it on video. I wouldn't quite have thought of that. Uh, so we started to understand that videos might be the place to go. And as Larissa said, I run the U.S. Farm State Association and we have a lot of members. And I was tracking what everybody else was doing and sharing what everybody else was doing. And I noticed that one of our members, Bar SC Ranch in California, was starting to do a lot of videos. And so I asked them to actually do a webinar for us and show us what they were doing because I thought it was interesting. They were home with four kids at home. They were doing homeschooling. And they decided, why don't we show people what we do on our farm? Uh, these days, if you want to do a YouTube channel, um, they discovered and they told me you have to have something like 200 followers before YouTube will let you have a channel. So at the time they didn't quite, but they were producing like three videos a week. They were letting their kids do it, pick the topics that they wanted to do. These days they do one video a week. They have continued to do this. Uh, you'll see some of the topics here that they let their kids do. Uh, they made it seem very easy. Uh, and so I thought, okay, well, let's, we should all be doing videos. 
and we should all be sharing videos. So I tried. So this was my very first attempt at uh, <laughs> shooting a video and my horse um, was having a meltdown. And so I'm just gonna show you this. I wasn't really sure how to do anything with sound. So I just took some video on my uh, phone and then we kind of knitted it together and we wrote over the top of it what it was. And so, you know, this is really pretty amateurish, um, but it was a place to start. Um, after I did this one, I thought, hey, you know, I can figure out how to do this better. Um, in the end, uh, it helps if you have some video production behind you. There's something called iMovie. We decided it wasn't really that easy to use. Um, I'm going to stop this here, but you can see I thought he was going to open this gate for me and he, he didn't. Uh, so let me get out of there. And then, um, you know, let me get to the next. Sorry. Next slide. Uh, so that was too hard for us. So we ended up with this, uh, with these virtual farm tours, uh, which were something that was going to be more live and didn't involve any production. Um, but you know what? I would love to say I'm the best marketer in the world. Uh, we came up with these virtual farm tours because we got asked. Uh, I had a guest who worked for uh, a big for-profit company, and they asked me if I could do a farm tour for their group, and they were going to involve their children, and they had offices all around the world. So um, I said, of course, I could do that and we could figure it out. And then prior to our actually doing it with them, a school also approached me because now you had all these kids being homeschooled or schooled through Zoom. And there was a local school that was teaching about farming. So they asked me if I could do a video for them. So we practiced actually with them first. And we got schooled because when we did the video, we were holding our camera vertical and we got halfway through it. And this kid said, you know, if you hold your camera horizontal, we'll be able to see a whole lot more. Well, just for your information, if you're on Zoom and you start with your camera in one direction, you can't switch it to the next direction. So we did, once we learned that, then we were able to take this uh, group, this company on a virtual tour of our farm in the horizontal position. And if you want to ask, you know, what do you charge for that? Well, they told me what they would pay. So if you see down here in this bottom corner, I charged $250 to them for a 30 minute virtual field trip. And so based on that price, um, the other school was a, I did it for free. Um, I started to do a little research to see what anybody else was charging for virtual uh, field trips. And there was a company in California, a nonprofit that had made it into the New York Times. And so I scanned their website to see what they were charging. And so I charged similarly. So you'll see somebody had asked before this what the pricing is. So basically I do public schools for free, private schools are $75, friends and family for 30 minutes. Uh, we do these little pop-ins for $75. I will tell you, we did a, a current, a recent one, if you do something like this, uh, make sure that the boss also knows that you're coming into one of their private corporate meetings because uh, when we popped in, uh, the boss hadn't been forewarned and they were very surprised that we were coming into a private meeting and it was a little awkward. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, we use uh, an iPhone. Uh, we're just uh, taping it. Now, look, we are coming in through other people's meetings. So it might be any meeting. It might be Google Meets. It might be Zoom. And so we're having to learn how to use those different meeting platforms. Um, and we're having to learn where all the different controls are, but we're getting better at it. Because of that, though, those guys may record, but I don't have any recordings of any of my actual virtual field trips. Uh, but I wanted to show you here, this is just kind of what this looks like. If I use somebody else to hold the camera. I am not doing selfies. And something that you need to know is that 
we're using the camera mode, which is a better visual than if you're doing the selfie and the camera is and the phone is facing towards you. Uh, there was a question then about connectivity. So you can see here, I'm standing at my barn. Uh, we do have connectivity out there. This is a map of our of our farm. Um, I have a repeater out here. This is the barn right here. My modem is right here. This is the farmhouse. And this is my cottage. Because I already am set up for a guest to be here, we already had wireless in this kind of area and we extended it over to here. And you can see right here, there's a little gap. So I have to tell people when I am walking from the barn over to the chicken yard, which is right here, that there is gonna be, we're gonna lose them for about 15 seconds. And there's nothing we've been able to figure out how to do that. I could put another repeater in, I just haven't. I wish I could get down to the garden. We're talking about potentially putting an extender down here so that I could get down this far and talk to people about our garden. Uh, but it just really depends on how, you know, what kind of uh, wireless you have and kind of how you get that set up. But it was something we already had set up. Um, this is just to give you an example of what um, this kind of looks like. I don't have the sound on for this, but this is me starting um, a tour. Uh, I, this is actually a free one. This is something we did copy. This is Facebook Live. Uh, we did it for our local tourism agency uh, because they asked us. And, you know, it might have been free, but if you can see here, there have been over a thousand views of this. And um, 200 were live at the time that we were doing this. Um, you know, everybody likes to see baby goats. What I started off with was a lesson about the difference between goats and sheep because we have goats and sheep. And what I was trying to demonstrate here, and this is what happens when you do livestock, is that they don't behave. And so all of my goats decided to put their tails down while I was talking. And my whole piece is that goats tails go up and sheep's tails go down. So that didn't really work. Um, but, uh, but from there, you know, I moved on. I took them in to see the sheep that were behind me. And then we went over to the chicken yard. Um, okay, so then uh, these are the things that when you were doing these events, somebody said, what do you need to think about? <laughs> so there are a lot of things you need to think about. And, you know, just like the, this webinar started, there's always little glitches that you just have to, you know, we're farmers. So we're kind of used to punting. So you just punt. But you do want to think about what the weather's like. What's your equipment going to be like out in the weather if it's raining or it's snowing? What is your connectivity? Have you practiced a little bit to see what are you going to do if you lose signal? Um, do you have kind of a backup plan? And then you need to think about what do you, what do you want to convey in your, this virtual tour? I mean, I do call them field trips. You know, basically I'm talking about our animals because we have livestock. I'm talking about what we do, about what a standard day is. Um, but I do ask when people want to do these virtual tours, what do they want to hear? Do they, you know, do they want to just have soft, fuzzy things? Do they want to know um, what all of our chores are? You know, what do they, what do they want to know? Um, you need to uh, know how to turn your camera around and you need to figure out somebody to help you because also not only are they t uh, t shooting the video, they may be looking at the chat and having to answer questions, or at least telling me what the question is, and then I can answer it live. When we were when we do schools, those kids call in and, and they they ask us questions. Um, so you want to be able to have more than just you trying to juggle all the things at the same time. And in this instance here, I was actually supposed to be doing a Zoom call with a radio with a TV station. They were late. I couldn't figure out what they were doing. I had put food in my pockets because I wanted to make sure that the sheep stayed around me. And um, Kate, who was shooting this video, shot a photograph because she thought it was funny that the sheep were just uh, attacking my pockets. Someone else asked, what kind of equipment do you use? Now, if you are doing this by yourself, um, I would suggest um, using a, a tripod. This right here is a, is a light ring. I use that um, 
you would use it if you're in a dark barn. Uh, a microphone, a microphone would be really useful. Right now, we just use the audio on our phone, but we're thinking of adding a microphone. I would probably do a wireless one, so I'm not attached to my phone. And then this is a gimbal right here. You know, when uh, Kate or Denny are following me with the camera, it, it shakes up and down. So a gimbal will make it so that it won't shake as much. Um, I've got the prices here. I just looked at those on Amazon. But basically, really, you just need a smartphone to start with. And all those other things can come later as you feel comfortable doing this and figure out how to do more of it. Um, again, we just do uh, Facebook Live events now. This was just showing people uh, how, to, how our horse gets shot. And um, these don't make any money, but they certainly uh, create interest um, in your social media platform. So if you're talking about um, other kinds of virtual events to do, and um, we thought that one was interesting because we were hot shoeing. Uh, but in the end, uh, we do have guests that come back on the farm now. So we're not just doing virtual tours or virtual stays. Uh, we do ask that they wear masks when they're with us. You know, I am hoping that we will get back to things like this because our guests do help us when the goats get out. And um, I do really love to share our farm in person if we can do that. And, uh, you know, virtual events now is just something else that we're going to be doing. And it's kind of really exciting uh, that there's another opportunity that I guess we could have thought of without COVID, but we didn't. So thank you very much. I will answer any questions at the end. All right. Thank you. Let me get back here. Um, I'm going to share this. Go back to our other talk. Thank you, Scotty. That was really, <laughs> that's really wonderful. I kind of, I'm glad I was on mute because I was laughing about some of the things you were saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, we will save any other questions um, <clears throat> for the end. I, I want to make sure that we uh, have some time for our, our, our second wonderful, fantastic presenter. Mm -hmm. um, our, uh, we have Lee, Lee Rankin. She is with, uh, from uh, the founder of Apple Hill Farm, which is a mountaintop alpaca farm and store in the high country of North Carolina. Um, and Lee is also has other affiliations. She is the president of the North Carolina Agritourism Networking Association. So she has a really good pulse of what's going on around her state. Um, so hopefully, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to, <laughs> to Lee. It sounds like your audio is on, <laughs> right? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear okay. you. Okay. Awesome. 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 Well, thank you so much for letting me join in on this. I'm super excited. Um, so like she said, I'm Lee, and I'm super happy to be here. So we started our farm back in 2003, the idea being we were going to raise alpacas. Um, I won't go into the whole story of it, but basically I was single with a two-year-old and decided that, hey, what a better time to start a mountaintop alpaca farm in a place where I know nobody and um, a place I'd never really, I'd been a couple of times, but didn't didn't know, know the area or anything, and I knew nothing about um, raising alpacas. So, so that's how the farm started, and very quickly we got into the back door of agritourism, which was bringing people onto the farm to teach them about farming. And our our agritourism is very education based. We found that a farm tour is the best way for us to show what it is that we have going on at the farm. So we have three sources of income on our farm. We have animal sales. We are selling alpacas. We also raise Angora goats, so we sell Angora goats. We raise livestock guardian dogs, Great Pyrenees, and we sell those as well. Um, and we sell lots of manure, <laughs> and we sell um, eggs from the farm and fiber from our animals. So those are kind of the, the farm-related sales that we have. We also have a store that we've developed over the years, and we sell probably 40 different kinds of alpaca socks. We sell lots of alpaca yarn. We sell meat from a local um, 
another farm that's just down the road that raises beef and pasture raised pork. Um, we have our eggs, we have bees, so we have honey. Um, we sell jams and jellies from a lady that used to live close by and makes jams and jellies. So we have a very expensive store that we've sort of built out over the years. It's been a slow process. None of this happened overnight. It was all very much a slow roll. And then our farm tours. And so our farm tours started out, it was something we did in the summer. We are now open and doing it seven days a week, most of the year. Um, and like everybody else in the middle of the pandemic, one of the things that we do is we take our fiber, our yarn, our fiber products, some of our socks out and we go to fiber shows. So there are two big ones in North Carolina. One would be this weekend, which is the Southeastern Animal Fiber Fair. And the other is the Carolina Fiber Fest, which was happening in Raleigh in March. And we got 98% set up four hours away from home for a show, and they called us over and sent us home because the governor had closed down the state. So that show didn't happen. We had all of our major expenses except for um, two nights of hotel rooms and meals already into the show, and we got sent home. So that's how COVID started for us. We also happened to hire lots of college students. So we're uh, near Boone, which is Appalachian State University, we hire a lot of college students from Boone. And um, the first commitment we made to our team was that we were not going to lay anybody off. I'm a mom of a 21-year-old who happens to be at Appalachian State. And many of the people that worked for us were four to six hours away from home. They were living in an apartment and they were doing online school. And I just couldn't bear to break that connection to them. So we made a caveat that they they quarantined if they'd been out of town for spring break, which was really smart on our part because most of them had been out of town in places, cruises and lots of places that were very high with COVID. So they all had their jobs when they came back. And of course we have a farm, there was plenty of work for them to do. We ended up getting a PPP loan. Um, and the next thing that we did was we tried to figure out how we could stay connected very much like Scotty said, stay connected to our audience. We used Facebook Live because we were closed at the farm um, to tour. So we did a Facebook Live every day and time that we would have done a tour. So we might just put a camera in the alpaca field and let them watch the alpacas graze. We, one time we went into the chicken coop and we did the chickens. Um, some of them were very interactive with us, but a lot of them were just videos of the animals because the animals are what really pulls people to us. Um, so um, so that's how we kind of started. And then we came up with the idea of doing Zoom calls with alpacas. Now, I have to say that I was the first one that was like, yeah, maybe that'll work. I don't know if it'll work or not. Anyway, we did it. And the equipment that we used was an iPad, a hotspot, so a cellular hotspot, um, and the iPad for our camera, and that was it. And so we set it up so that one person could go out into the field and jump on the Zoom call with a hotspot in their pocket and um, do the entire experience themselves. Of course, the first year we did it with more than one of us there. But that's how we did it. And we did, so Scotty, we need to charge more for ours, I think, but we charged um, $10 a device because we had lots of families tuning in that were home and in quarantine. So we did it very early on. And so grandma could be in Tennessee on her device and somebody else could be in Texas and somebody else could be someplace else. And we just charged per device. So it was $10 per device um, for 10 minutes. <laughs> so we did over a hundred of these before it was all said and done, which is, just blows me away. And then we had people ask for late night calls. So we did after hour alpaca calls. And those were mostly West Coast. And so it was after hours for us, but it was, you know, 530 for them. So we charged a little bit more for those. And then same thing that Scotty got, we had people wanting us to join their meeting. And so we charged a little bit more for that, and we called it a llama bomb, and we would come to their meeting. And just like Scotty, we found out that you need to make sure that the person leading the meeting knows that llamas are going to come on because they did not appreciate it. There were a couple of really awkward meetings that we did with people. 
But the thing that was really interesting about it in the midst of all of it was that we were international. So one of our calls was somebody in Germany and somebody in Brazil, and they were, it was a date, and they were on together on the alpaca call, and it was a surprise. So we, it was like, this is really interesting. Here we are, shut down in a pandemic, and we're able to reach a clientele that we don't normally reach. Um, we are still doing these. We still offer these. And like, like Scotty, we've reopened and we're very busy doing tours. In order to accommodate our lower numbers of people per tour, we spread our tours out across the day. And so we're doing um, actually more tours than we did last year. Last year, we finished the year with a little over 900 tours for the year. And we are already over 1,100 for the year this year. So, so we've done more tours, smaller ones. But what it's done for us going through COVID is it's pushed us back to pre-selling all our tickets so that we can manage the flow of people. It's also made us go smaller. And I think it's increased the quality of our experience because we're not getting a Saturday afternoon where we have too many people for a tour. Um, we're able to manage the, the flow of people coming into the farm. So we're still doing all of it. <laughs> and the other virtual thing that we've done is we are a part of a um, craft fair every year in October. It would have been last Saturday. And they went virtual with their craft fair. So it's a fundraiser for our local community. It's called the Valley Country Fair. 12,000 people come to this fair is one day fair. It is our biggest retail day of the year. And so in order to accommodate that, we went virtual with our support of the fair and said, okay, 10% of every online order that we get, we will contribute to the fair from the beginning of October until fair weekend. And then the week of the fair, everything that we do 10% off the top will go to the fair. And we actually ended up being able to contribute exactly what we did last year, which was so exciting because it's money that goes to the group that runs the fair, but then ultimately goes in our community. And we got to see, so bonus round, we got to see some of the people that only see us when we're set up at the fair. So they got to come to the farm and see the farm. So big bonus round for that. A um, couple of other things. We don't advertise per se. We have one very small ad that runs in a local quarterly magazine for yarn. And other than that, we do Facebook, um, we're on Instagram, and we're involved with our chambers, and we do a lot of community outreach. And then that's it in terms of what we do locally. And then there's good old Google, that when you come to Banner Out North Carolina and you Google things to do, Google pops us up as a thing to do. So we don't have to pay for that. It's out there. TripAdvisor is one of our bigger places that being, bring people through. Um, and last year in December, we decided we were getting worried about the numbers of people that were coming to the farm. We made that one of those decisions that's like, I don't know, let's try it, let's see what happens. And we decided to start ticketing online as an option so that you had the option to ticket for a tour online, and we did it through Peak Pro. It's called, it's um, their website, and I'm gonna put it in the chat in a little bit. It's www.peak.com, and it's P-E-E-K. Um, and they charge a little bit of a service charge. They barely charge us. They're super easy to work with. And so we did it right before Christmas last year, and Christmas is actually a big season for us. Um, and we were amazed at how many people would jump online and buy tickets that would not have gotten the information they needed to come. So on a Sunday night, we would look and it was like we had seven people booked for the next day. By the next morning, we had 50 people booked. So it has been a huge boon for us. But there's a couple of things that have really helped us. And I'm saying this for those of you who may not already be doing agritourism on your farms. It allowed us to get the information we needed to our customer to them before they ever got in th through the door. They knew to wear closed toed shoes. They knew to be dressed for the weather. They knew that we did it rain or shine. They knew that we didn't have apples, even though our name was Apple Hill Farm. All of those things that we would answer over and over and over and over again on the phone, they had in their hands before they ever came. 
we also had the ability then to communicate with them if something happened. For instance, um, one weekend we had snow before the weekend and we were four-wheel drive only coming up to the farm and we were able to send an email out to everybody who had bought a ticket to that point and just say, hey guys, we're four-wheel drive only. If you need to change your tickets, here's the link. Um, so that's been a huge boon to us. And as we went through COVID, that was the first thing we did was we said, from here on out, we're pre-ticketed only. Because for us to stay open during COVID, we need to keep our numbers down. So we're doing 10 people per tour right now. Um, we started out doing a tour and it was your quarantine group. So if there were two of you in the household, it was two people on a tour. If there were eight of you in your household, it could be eight people, but we kept it really small. Um, and now we just spread those tours out so that we don't have too many people on the farm at one time and we can keep our number where it needs to be. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to say about that. There's other events that we do that we've been able to carry forward with and just make smaller since we went through COVID. And that is we do um, an Agritourism Works workshop, which is a one day workshop with me where I talk about agritourism and help farms get clear about who they are as an agritourism farm and what they want to do. And then we also do a photo tour which we've been able to continue with a smaller number where we have a photographer come and do a behind the scenes tour and you learn how to do photographs either with your phone or a, a camera. Um, I'm trying to think what else in terms of that. I think that's it, but from the agritourism standpoint, I wish we were live and you could tell me how many of you are doing agritourism activities already on your farm. So, um, it's an incredible way to share as a farmer what it is that you do beyond what it is that you produce. Like all of us are producing something that customers are coming for, but not always are they learning behind the scenes about how things are produced um, and how, you know, how we care for our animals. I mean, on our farm, we have a group of animals that kind of work together. We have llamas and donkeys that guard our alpacas. We have guardian dogs that guard our goats. And all of it sort of works together, right? And those are things that people wouldn't just necessarily know if they came to pick up eggs and bought eggs from us. So we then have a chance to tell the story of how the farm started and how the animals got to be there. Many of our animals happen to be rescues, and they have these really sweet stories about how they got to us and how they've transformed since they've been there. And so we're able to tell those in a guided walking tour as they tour the farm. I'm looking to see if there's any question. Um, so, and you're asking about marketing. We didn't, I don't know how we market. I guess we just market it through social media. Most of ours most of our marketing is really low res <laughs> in terms of by the time we take care of the animals and take care of the people coming, there isn't a lot of energy left over. So it's about people finding us and reaching out. We happen to get some, and this is where, Scott, where um, Larissa could play this video. So we happen to do, in the middle of COVID, we did four TV interviews where it was just us on the farm doing uh, Zoom calls on our computer or our iPad and nobody had to, like, we didn't need a cameraman because we were doing all this, like this video right here that she's showing, let's see, she's gonna play it. This beginning video in the fog is actually us. And I believe we did have two things going at the same time, but that's videotaped on a camera, right? You can see here's the producer in his, studio talking about it. It was a horrible foggy day. I looked horrible by the time it went on. Um, and he had already done a story on us, so he pieced together some video from some other stuff that he had done. Um, but it was, we were able to get some news media about what we were doing without ever leaving the farm using the same technology that we used for our virtual calls, which was amazing. And it really breaks open the idea of how do you get, you know, to your customer the quickest, easiest way 
And face on over a computer seems to be a really fast way to do it. So these are some of our babies. And, and that, I'm sure we got a lot of um, hits from that. We've actually gotten a few people that want to come and do in-person events as a result of this as well. <laughs> this is Basil. That's Basil, our llama. Anyway, um, what are some of the other questions? Uh, let's see. Yeah, so our ticketing is done through PEAK. Um, we end up, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but we've ended up using all sorts of different ways to um, have people pay for things. We're using Peak. We also can use Square. Um, our website, which we sell on the website, we use Stripe. Um, so there are lots of different ways that we do that. But I just want to just want to do a little plug for those of you who are not doing agritourism yet. People are really, really hungry for this. And I've watched from a state level because the North Carolina Agritourism Networking Association got really involved with the state in terms of helping them to figure out in March and April when strawberry farms were about to open up for their youth pick season, how they would do that and how they would navigate and pivot through COVID. And they did such creative things like one farm did they marked all of their rows, and one row was yellow, the next row was blue, the next row was yellow, the next row was blue. And so they would say, today's a yellow day, and you can only pick on the yellow row. And then that automatically kept people six feet apart. Um, they did things like they had people pick in buckets, and they took the buckets with them, so there was no worry about having to decontaminate buckets. During peach season, we had a peach farmer who used to... <laughs> take everybody out to the peach field on a hay wagon, and they realized that probably wasn't safe. So the hay wagon became a way just to get the peaches back from the field because a basket of peaches is really heavy. And so they just would have people label their baskets and bring them back and unload them at the parking lot. Um, and it's, you know, it's across the board and lots of farms have gone to pre-ticketing. Um, I think that from the people that I've talked to that are farming and doing agritourism, the ones that are pre-ticketing are feeling more comfortable with the onslaught of people coming to the farm because they can manage it safely and feel safe about it. Um, there's nothing, you know, before it was kind of fun every once in a while if you had a Saturday and a bunch of people showed up. Nowadays with COVID, it's a little scary, you know, to have too many people show up on one day. We are still doing masks because of our, um, the North Carolina laws, we're doing masks mandatory all through the tour so, we did, so that we don't have to worry about it and that our customer doesn't have to worry about it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. But anyway, if anybody wants to talk about agritourism, I'm your girl. I love it. And um, it's what keeps me in touch with the value that I have as a farmer. I know farming can be hard and grueling and difficult. And staying in touch with the value is the most important piece to what I do. So well, that's it. All right. So we've hey, got comments in the thing. Yeah. Very good. Coming back. We're coming back on. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lee. That was wonderful. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> I love that you, yeah, kind of the complimentary information that you both shared. Um, so I'm going to just going to kind of scroll back up and we'll get through as many, yeah. you know, comments or questions as we can. Um, you know, and if folks have follow up, we can, of course, you know, do that offline. But um, so there's a question from Roger about this is probably particular to you, um, Lee, about covering the salary for college kids. And if these college kids are the ones that are doing the tours for you about what was the question about about covering how do you you know in, in a normal year how do you cover the salary of the college kids that you employ and are they the ones doing tours the leading the tours they're the ones yeah our college students are generally the ones that are doing our tours they're also doing other things and um you know our tour fees are now our our income leader, whereas our store was the leader before. In the beginning, it was animals. Now, then the store took over, and now tours have taken over. Um, so yeah, and 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 
um, it's on the honor system, but I don't know anything about chips, but I think there may be chips involved. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what do you charge for? <laughs> When they, when they ask me, I always say, these are hungry college students. I know they'll appreciate it. <laughs> what, what do you charge for a tour? We charge, oh, good question. I think we're charging 18. We just changed our pricing structure because we're so busy on the weekends and we've pushed it to more on the weekends and less during the week. And um, so, and we just started charging for infants. So we um and and people are people are paying it they're very appreciative they're excited to be out um they know that we're going to great pains to keep everything safe and sanitized during the time that they're there so anyway yeah so well on that theme um there's a question about how and maybe both of you could um answer this if you'd like. Um, I'll throw it to Scotty first about how you handle biosecurity on your farm to keep the animals safe for, you know, all the people that are coming and going. Yep. So the reality is I don't make people wear boots or do anything like that. We do have hand sanitizer out at our barn that I encourage people to use. And we had that before COVID was there. Uh, but it's more like protecting our guests and protecting our animals. We do have a bathroom with hot water. Again, I point that out to people. Uh, but, you know, most of our guests are coming from the city. And so when I think of biosecurity, I think of that as farm to farm. And it's not like these people are stopping at another farm and then coming to ours. So you could say that I'm not really good at biosecurity. We haven't had any issues. Uh, and I guess it's just that I haven't felt as if the people coming were going to cause those issues. Nobody's wearing boots. They all are wearing inappropriate shoes. Uh, and um, so I guess I just, I haven't done much about that. So maybe my, maybe my bad. Lee, do you want to talk about yeah, anything? So you guys have a lot of people on, on the farm. Know, we don't have to worry too much about biosecurity. When we did, were part of a quote farm tour where they were going farm to farm. We had um, mats with, I think it was a vinegar solution that we were using. That used it was a it was a pan with a mat in it that you stood in while you signed in, and that was long enough based on the farm tour that we were safe between farms. When we had the avian bird flu scare, we um, put panels around our chicken coop so that you couldn't get close to the chicken coop. We don't take people into the chicken coop anyway, but we just, you know, so we had like an extra foot. Um, but normally we're not too worried about biosecurity because we've got goats and alpacas and we're not raising anything that really, that's an issue. I'm the one that has to worry about if I go to other farms because lots of my hog farmer friends in North Carolina, because I have two pigs, I'm not allowed to go in their um, hog farms, their hog houses. Uh -huh. So I think I probably have to worry about it more than our customers do. So thank you. Thank you for that. So there's a question that um, I think you uh, answered <clears throat> in the chat, Scotty. It's about. Um, recording tours and if you are um, kind of selling the replays um, or, you know, because uh, there's someone who's saying that they did a, they did, re, they did, re, you know, record it and um, uh, so they're planning to launch or charge for the replay. I don't know if you, sounds like, uh, Scotty, you are doing things live and Lee, do you have any experience with? We're, you know, what we record, <laughs> we, we, um, worked on one before we reopened and never really got it finessed in a way that we felt good about. We really felt like if we were going to have a evergreen product on our website that was a virtual tour that we needed to get something a little bit more professional than us just splicing together. Um, and we do have, we did do videos with each animal that we could take a Zoom group through a virtual tour of the farm. Um, and we actually did a promo of it, but we just have never really followed up on that. It's a great idea. And I think as spring hits and farm and um, field trip time hits, it could be a really saleable product for farms um, to do educational. And I'll, I'll give you a hint. 
the five-year-old has ag in the classroom with already done um, curriculum and materials, and somebody could take something like that, and I'm sure there's a zillion of them out there, and really run with it and put together prepackaged virtual video tour kinds of things. Um, we just haven't, we got so busy once we opened, and we're in a touristy area that's been really, really slammed all summer, so um, best laid plans, but we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I would also add to that, that. I mean, you know, that one that I showed of my horse at the beginning, I was like, yeah, we're going to put all these videos together and we're going to make all this money. Uh, they take a long time and you need to actually have mm -hmm. some technical expertise and maybe not just iMovie. And so it's even worth potentially mm -hmm. paying somebody if you're going to just do it, want to put something together that looks pretty good because it can look pretty bad if you <laughs> don't do it well and then it's hard it would be hard to sell so um it just, it just depends on if you have the ability you know the experience good winter project maybe i don't yeah. know yeah <laughs> um so there's a couple questions that are similar about there people are kind of wondering about the nuts and bolts about um the shorts and and i, I think that you do some of these too uh scotty but in uh um the, the 10 minute kind of alpaca Zoom calls or the, the, the lava bombs or um, what, what happens during one of them? Is it just like there's some uh, an animal on screen? That's it. So for us, we go, for us, we go out into the field um, with the animals and it's as much interaction or as little as you want it to be. We've had um, people that are in nursing homes and there's not a lot of interaction. And then we've had, you know, grandmother with her three-year-old and there's lots of questions and we're answering questions, giving names of the animals, introducing. So it really is, um, each one is different. And in the beginning, this was one of our mistakes. We thought, oh, this is super simple. We can do, you know, four of these in an hour, but it's exhausting because you are in four different locations with four different groups in an hour. And it, it is a lot of, um, mental, I don't know if it's emotional, but you know, it's that unspoken energy that takes, it takes a lot to do them. Um, and not everybody on our farm does them. We only have a few people that are sort of not licensed, but approved to do them because it does take a lot of interaction. It takes a lot of flexibility. The llama bombs, especially because you don't know what you're going to get when you get in there. Um, we did, I mean, our unfortunate story was somebody paid for us to come into some, um, it was a college and it was their meeting of all their professors. And we, when we busted in, they were talking about students. And it was like, ah, oh, <laughs> go out and come back in. <laughs> and then people were like, there's a llama on the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, we, we muddled through it, but it was really awkward. So those are, I think, are the harder ones to do. Um, they're harder also, like Scotty brought up, because of technology, because you can be in six different, you know, you can be in all sorts of different configurations of Zoom or WebEx or whatever it is. Whereas when we're doing our regular llama call, then you call in to the call, it's our Zoom channel. So we just just pop right in. It's all programmed in the phone or the iPad. It's super easy to do. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yep. Anything you want to add to that, Scotty? Just no, about. not really. No, I think the lead pretty much got <laughs> all of it. I mean, because yeah, you're you're doing this pop in, and you're not really exactly sure. And then plus, you deal, well, we deal with livestock, so you know, you don't know if the if they're looking the right direction, if they're focusing into the camera. If you're, I, I, it, it, as Lee said, it's emotionally draining or it's like you're on stage and you just want to make sure because you're charging money for it you want to make sure you're doing a really good presentation i guess that's really what it is and so mm -hmm. you're just happy when it goes okay <laughs> there's a lot of unknowns right you don't know your yeah. audience and then yeah. you there's only yeah. so much control you can have over your wily animals yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I'm going to, I think one more question that was asked by a couple people um, had to do with, uh, and I think this has more to do with the on-farm components, but the li any kind of liability insurance that you have for those type of events or interactions with um, people coming onto your property. Um, we'll oh, start yeah, with. You go first. <laughs> okay. Well, I have, a, I have, so I have my farm policy, but I also have a business liability policy, which would be called like trip and fall insurance. Similar to North Carolina with Lee, we have a limited liability agritourism law. So I have signs at the front of my farm and wherever people park uh, that basically say we're farms are dangerous places. You come on acknowledging the risk. Um, we're not liable. Um, I also, because I have a horse and a donkey, I have, there's an equine law, which is kind of similar. I have, again, signs posted out where my horse and donkey live that people see, and they're relatively large. So between that and my business liability policy, that's pretty much how we're covered and our farm policy. And then we, and we have an umbrella. We have a $2 million, <laughs> we have a $2 million umbrella on top of all of it, just in case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, ditto on all of that. We have all of that. I have a farm policy umbrella. We have an agritourism policy that we keep, and it covers us for people coming on the farm, but it also covers us when we go off the farm. So this this is just a hoot, right? So when we're out selling yarn, I mean, God forbid somebody should get hit with a skein of yarn, right? Or actually... More seriously, if you're at a show and your display should fall, right, that's a yeah. whole liability. And more and more of our craft vendors are, or craft uh, shows are requiring vendors to have insurance. So we kind of have insurance, like whether we're home or not, or sometimes we'll go out with just animals to the local school or something. So we have insurance for that. And we have insurance that we get for when we go for shows. So a little bit of everything and we and like she said we have the north carolina agritourism statute that's part of state law that if you have it posted supposedly you're not allowed to be sued but you know how that is so we also have workers comp for our workers which is um is another piece of it insurance is a big deal you know so yep. absolutely um so I know there's some other questions that are probably coming in and pe percolating in people's <laughs> heads after, you know, sometimes it takes a little while to figure out, you know, what you need to ask if you're, you might be considering it. So um, I think that, you know, just to respect everyone's time, I'm going to, you know, we're going to wrap this up pretty shortly, but uh, um, I will be CCing the presenters on um, our follow-up email tomorrow. So if you do have any, any other questions that come up, um, you know, feel free to check out their websites too. I think that it's really helpful to kind of see how things are are displayed and broken down, and you know, give some information about registration and all that um, sort of thing. But so, just a few housekeeping items before before we sign off officially. Um, a reminder that there is a very very short survey that will pop up on your screen as soon as I close out this webinar. If you could take it and give us um, any feedback, that'd be wonderful. Um, also, like I said, a recording and the slides are going to be available soon. Uh, I'll do my best to get those out to, to folks as soon as I can, either today or tomorrow. Um, a quick plug for some of our other upcoming webinars and other things that are going on this fall um, starting next week. Um, we are going to be hosting, and then into November, I should say, we're going to be hosting a three-part Zillow Pasture webinar series with Steve Gabriel, who's a wonderful presenter. He's with Cornell. Um, he uh, wrote a Zillow, Zillow Pasture book. Um, he's an educator, an author, um, a farmer. So if you're interested in, along those lines, please join us. There's several more that are in the process of being scheduled about other topics as well. So, um, and a reminder that our Fund of Farmer grants are currently uh, open, the applications, I should say. So check those out. Our mentorship program will be opening in um, a couple weeks as well. Um, we have scholarships and some customized handouts if folks are interested in getting uh, information about pasture-raised food out to their customers. So um, I think on that note, that's all the time we have. Um, it was really, really wonderful to have <laughs> both you ladies on. I'm so glad we get it to work after 
you know, <laughs> everything, this, this webinar about technology and virtualness and, you know, it, it all came together. I think it was spectacular and it was, you know, my an honor to have you and a real pleasure to, to host. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that stayed around in the audience and asked such wonderful questions and hopefully, you know, kind of take some of this information home and make makes it their own. Um, so I hope everyone's has a great afternoon that we're able to connect again soon, virtually, maybe someday in person. <laughs> and um, on that note, I'm going to sign off. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye.